listening, squirrels? I think we got a lot more people listening according to my numbers. So, yay! If you don't know it, if you're new and you don't know it, I have lots of books that I've already read, complete books, and, and some series that I did, complete series, like Little House on the Prairie, um, uh, Little Women, all but one book we forgot, or I forgot, to read Good Wives. I may go back and grab that one one of these days. But now we're on the Anne of Avonlea series. So I read Anne of Green Gables. Is that the first one? Anne of Green Gables. Then what was it? Whatever we read second. This is the third book. Anne of Wendy Poplar. Poplars. Anne of Wendy Poplars. Uh, Anne of the Island. Anne of the Island was the second one. Yeah. So, if you go to my playlist, each book's, you know, under its own title, like this AOWP is Anne of Wendy Poplar. I just hate to type that out. I'm that lazy every day. So, but anyway, we're on chapter 13 of our current book, Anne of Wendy Poplar's. Ah, oh, when you've been old and bed read as long as me, you'll have more sympathy, whined Mrs. Gibson. Oh, don't you just want to whack that lady? Please don't think I'm lacking in sympathy, Mrs. Gibson, said Anne, who after half an hour's vain effort felt like wringing Mrs. Gibson's neck. <laughs> Nothing but poor Pauline's pleading eyes in the background kept her from giving up in despair and going home. I assure you, you won't be lonely and neglected. I'll be here all day and see that you lack nothing in any way. Oh, I know I'm of no use to anyone, said Mrs. Gibson, apropos of nothing that had been said. You don't need to rub that in, Miss Shirley. I'm ready to go any time, any time. Pauline can gad round all she wants to. I won't be here to feel neglected. None of the young people of today have any sense. Giddy, very giddy. Anne didn't know whether it was Pauline or herself who was the giddy young person without sense, but she tried the last shot in her locker. Well, you know, Mrs. Gibson, people will talk so terribly if Pauline doesn't go to her cousin's silver wedding. Talk, said Mrs. Gibson sharply. What will they talk about? Dear Mrs. Gibson, may I be forgiven that adjective, thought Anne. In your long life, you have learned, I know, just what idle tongues can say. You needn't be casting my age up to me, snapped Mrs. Gibson, and I don't need to be told it's a censorous world. Too well, too well, I know. And I don't need to be told that this town is full of tattling toads, neither, but... I don't know as I fancy them jabbering about me saying I suppose that I'm an old tyrant. I ain't stopping Pauline from going. Didn't I leave it to her conscience? So few people will believe that, said Anne, carefully sorrowful. Mrs. Gibson sucked a peppermint loz lozenge fiercely for a minute or two, and then she said, I hear there's mumps at White Sands. My dear, you know I've had the mumps. There's folks as takes them twice. You'd be just the one to take them twice, Pauline. You always took everything that come round. The nights I've set up with you, not expecting you to see the morning. Ah, me, a mother's sacrifices ain't long remembered. <laughs> Gosh. Besides, how would you get to White Sands? You ain't been on a train for years, and there ain't any train going back Saturday night. She could go on the Saturday morning train, said Anne, and I'm sure Mr. James Gregor will bring her back. I never liked Jim Gregor. His mother was a tar bush. He's taking his double-seated buggy and going down Friday, or else he would take her down, too, but she'll be quite safe on the train, Mrs. Gibson. Just step on at Summerside, step off at White Sands. No changing. There's something behind all this, said Mrs. Gibson suspiciously. Why are you all set on her going, Miss Shirley? Just tell me that. Anne smiled into the beady-eyed face because I think Pauline is a good, kind.
kind daughter to you, Mrs. Gibson, and needs a day off now and then, just as everybody does. Most people found it hard to resist and smile. Either that or the fear of gossip vanquished Mrs. Gibson. I suppose it never occurs to anyone I'd like a day off from this wheelchair if I could get out, if I could get it, but I can't. I just have to bear my affliction patiently. Well, if she must go, she must. She's always been one to get her own way. Brother. If she catches mumps or gets poisoned by strange Makitas, <laughs> Makitas, <laughs> mosquitoes, don't blame me for it. I'll have to get along as best I can. Oh, I suppose you'll be here, but you ain't used to my ways as Pauline, as Pauline is. I suppose I can stand it for one day if I can't. Well, I've been living on borrowed time many's the year now, so what's the difference? Not a gracious ascent by any means, but still an ascent. Anne, in her relief and gratitude, found herself doing something she could never have imagined herself doing. She bent over and kissed Mrs. Gibson's leathery cheek. Thank you, she said. Never mind your wheedling ways, said Mrs. Gibson. Have a peppermint. How can I ever thank you, Miss Shirley, said Pauline, as she went a little way down the street with Anne. By going to White Sands with a light heart, enjoying every minute of it, of the time. Oh, I'll do that. You don't know what this means to me, Miss Shirley. It's not only Louisa I want to see. The old luckly place next to her home is going to be sold, and I did so want to see it once more before it passed into hands of into the hands of strangers. Mary Luckley, she's Mrs. Howard Fleming now and lives out west, was my dearest friend when I was a girl. We were like sisters. I used to be at the Luckley place so much, and I loved it so. I've often dreamed of going back. Ma says I'm getting too old to dream. Do you think I am, Miss Shirley? Nobody is ever too old to dream, and dreams never grow old. I'm so glad to hear you say that. Oh, Miss Shirley, to think of seeing the Gulf again. I haven't seen it for 15 years. The harbor is beautiful, but it isn't the Gulf. I feel as if I was walking on air, and I owe it all to you. It's just because Ma likes you, she let me go. You've made me happy. You're always making people happy. Why, whenever you come into a room, Miss Shirley, Miss Shirley, the people in it feel happier. That's the very nicest compliment I've ever had paid me, Pauline. There's just one thing, Miss Shirley. I've nothing to wear but my old black taffeta. It's too gloomy for a wedding, isn't it? And it's too big for me since I got thin. You see, it's six years since I got it. We must try to induce your mother to let you have a new dress, said Anne, hopefully. But that proved to be beyond her powers. Mrs. Gibson was adamant. Pauline's black taffeta was plenty good for Louisa Hilton's wedding. I paid two dollars a yard for it six years ago and three to Jane Sharp for making it. Jane was a good dressmaker. Her mother was a smiley. The idea of you wanting something light, Pauline Gibson. She'd go dressed in scarlet from head to foot, that one, if she was let, Miss Shirley. She's just waiting till I'm dead to do it. Ah, well, you'll soon be shed of all the trouble I am to you, Pauline. Then you can dress as gay and giddy as you like. But as long as I'm alive, you'll be decent. And what's the matter with your hat? It's time you wore a bonnet anyway. Or anyhow. Anyhow. Poor Pauline had a lively horror of having to wear a bonnet. She would wear her old hat for the rest of her life before she would do that. I'm just going to be glad inside and forget all about my clothes, she told Anne when they went out to the garden to pick a bouquet of June lilies and bleeding heart for the widows. I have a plan, said Anne with a cautious glance to make sure Mrs. Gibson couldn't hear her, though she was watching from the sitting room window. You know that silver gray poplin of mine? I'm going to lend you that for the wedding. Pauline dropped the basket of flowers in her agitation, making a pool of pink and white sweetness at Anne's feet. 
Oh, my dear, I couldn't. Ma would let me. She won't know a thing about it. Listen, Saturday morning you'll put it on under your black taffeta. I know it will fit you. It's a little long, but I'll run some tucks in it tomorrow. Tucks are fashionable now. It's collarless with elbow sleeves, so no one will suspect. As soon as you get to Gull Cove, take off the taffeta. When the day is over, you can leave the poplin at Gull Cove, and I can get it the next weekend I'm home. But wouldn't it be too young for me? Not a bit. Any age can wear gray. Do you think it would be right to deceive Ma? Faltered Pauline. In this case, entirely right, said Anne shamelessly. You know, Pauline, it would never do to wear a black dress to a wedding. It might bring the bride bad luck. Oh, I wouldn't want to do that for anything, and of course it won't hurt Ma. I do hope she'll get through Saturday, all right? I'm afraid she won't eat a bite when I'm away. She didn't the time I went to Cousin Matilda's funeral. Miss Prouty told me she didn't. Miss Prouty stayed with her. She was so provoked at Cousin Matilda for dying. Ma was, I mean. <laughs> she'll eat. I'll see to that. I know you've a great knack of managing her, conceded Pauline, and you won't forget to give her her medicine at the regular times, will you, dear? Oh, perhaps I oughtn't to go after all. You've been out there long enough to pick 40 bo bouquets, called Mrs. Gibson irately. I don't know what the widows want of your flowers. They've plenty of their own. I'd go a long time without flowers if I waited for Rebecca Dew to send me any. I'm dying for a drink of water, but then I'm of no consequence. Friday night, Pauline telephoned Anne in terrible agitation. She had a sore throat, and did Miss Shirley think it would be possible that it could possibly be the mumps? Anne ran down to reassure her, taking the gray poplin and a brown paper parcel. She hid it in the lilac bush, and late that night, Pauline, in a cold perspiration, managed to smuggle it upstairs to the little room where she kept her clothes and dress, though she was never permitted to sleep there. Pauline was not quite easy about the dress. Perhaps her sore throat was a judgment on her for deception. But she couldn't go to Louisa's silver wedding in that dreadful old black taffeta. She simply couldn't. Saturday morning, Anne was at the Gibson house, bright and early. Anne always looked her best on, a, best on a sparkling summer morning such as this. She seemed to sparkle with it, and she moved through the golden air like a slender figure on a Grecian urn. The dullest room sparkled, too, lived when she came into it. Walking as if you own the earth, commented Mrs. Gibson sarcastically. So I do, said Anne gaily. Ah, you're very young, said Mrs. Gibson mat mattingly. Mattingly. I guess that's the name. <laughs> uh, la, la, la. I withhold not my heart from any joy, quoted Anne. That is Bible authority for you, Miss Gi Mrs. Gibson. Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. That's in the Bible, too, retorted Mrs. Gibson. The fact that she had so neatly countered Miss Shirley B.A. put her in comparably good humor. Uh, comparatively. I never was one to flatter Miss Shirley, but that chip hat of yours with the blue flower kind of set you. Your hair don't look so red under it, seems to me. Don't you admire a fresh young girl like this, Pauline? Wouldn't you like to be a fresh young girl yourself, Pauline? Pauline was too happy and excited to want to be anyone but herself just then. Anne went to the upstairs room with her to help her dress. It's so lovely to think of all the pleasant things that must happen today, Miss Shirley. My throat is quite well, and Ma's in such a good humor. You mightn't think so, but I know she is because she's talking, even if she is sarcastic. If she's mad or riled, she'll be sulking. I've peeled the potatoes, and the steak is in the icebox, and Ma's blanc mange 
is down cellar. There's canned chicken for supper and a sponge cake in the pantry. I'm just on tender hooks, Ma'll change her mind yet. I couldn't bear it if she did. Oh, Miss Shirley, do you think I'd better wear that gray dress, really? Put it on, said Anne in her best school teacherish, ma teacherish manner. Pauline obeyed and emerged a transformed Pauline. The gray dress fitted her beautifully. It was collarless and had dainty rust lace ruffles in the elbow sleeves. When Anne had done her hair, Pauline hardly knew herself. I hate to cover it up with that hard old black taffeta, Miss Shirley. But it had to be. The taffeta covered it very securely. The old hat went on, but it would be taken off too when she got to Louisa's. And Pauline had a new pair of shoes. Mrs. Gibson had actually allowed her to get a new pair of shoes, though she thought the heels scandalous high. I'll make quite a sensation going on the train alone. I hope people won't think it's a death. <laughs> I wouldn't want Louise's silver wedding to be connected in any way with the thought of death. Oh, perfume, Miss Shirley, apple blossom. Isn't that lovely? Just a whiff, so ladylike. I always think Ma won't let me buy any. Oh, Miss Shirley, you won't forget to feed my dog, will you? I've left his bones in the pantry in the covered dish. I do hope, dropping her voice to a shamed whisper, that he won't misbehave in the house while you're here. Pauline had to pass her mother's inspection before leaving. Excitement over her outing and guilt in regard to the hidden poplin combined to give her a very unusual flush. Mrs. Gibson gazed at her discontentedly. Oh me, oh my, going to London to look at the Queen, are we? we you've got too much color. People will think you're painted. Are you sure you ain't? Oh no, ma, no. In shock tones, mind your manners now, and when you sit down, cross your ankles decently. Mind you don't sit in a draft or talk too much. I won't, Ma, promised Pauline earnestly with a nervous glance at the clock. I'm sending Louisa a bottle of my sarsaparilla wine to drink the toast in. I never cared for Louisa, but her mother was a tack of berry. Mind you bring back the bottle and don't. Let her give you a kitten. Louisa's always giving people kittens. I want Ma. You're sure you didn't leave the soap in the water? Quite sure, Ma, with another anguished glance at the clock. Are your shoelaces tied? Yes, Ma. You don't smell respectable, drenched with scent. Oh, no, Ma, dear. Just a little, the tiniest bit. I said drenched, and I mean drenched. There isn't a rip under your arm, is there? Oh, no, Ma. Let me see. Inexorably. Pauline quakes. Suppose the skirt of the gray dress showed when she lifted up her arms. Well, go then, with a long sigh. If I ain't here when you come back, remember that I want to be laid out in my lace shawl and my black satin slippers and see that my hair is crimped. Do you feel any worse, Ma? The poplin dress had made Pauline's conscience very sensitive. If you do, I'll not go. And waste the money for them shoes? Of course you're going, and mind you don't slide down the banister. But at this, the worm turned. Ma, did you think I would? You did at Nancy Parker's wedding. Thirty-five years ago, do you think I'd do it now? It's time you were off. What are you jabbering here for? Do you want to miss your train? <laughs> Excuse me. I got a little fruity tea this morning. It's so good. And it's mixed with Earl Grey from Israel. That Miss... Seagal sent me. Got Mama Swift, Jaxie Lavender, <laughs> and Seagal. I put them all in one cup. 
Pauline hurried away, and Anne sighed with relief. She had been afraid that old Miss Gibson had at the last moment been taken with the fiendish impulse to detain Pauline until the train was gone. Now, for a little peace, said Mrs. Gibson, this house is in an awful condition of untidiness, Miss Shirley. I hope you realize it ain't always so. Pauline hasn't known which end of her was up these last few days. Will you please set that vase an inch to the left? No, move it back again. That lampshade is crooked. Well, that's a little straighter, but that blind's an inch lower than the other. I wish you'd fix it. Anne unluckily gave the blind too energetic a twist. It escaped her fingers and went whizzing to the top. Ah, now you see, said Miss Gibson. Anne didn't see, but she adjusted the blind meticulously. And now, wouldn't you like to make... And now, wouldn't you like me to make you a nice cup of tea, Mrs. Gibson? I do need something. I'm clean wore out with all this worry and fuss. My stomach seems to be dropping out of me, said Mrs. Gibson pathetically. Can you make a decent cup of tea? I'd as soon drink mud as the tea some folks may make. Marilla Cuthbert taught me how to make tea, you'll see. But first, I'm going to wheel you out to the porch so you can enjoy the sunshine. I ain't been out on the porch for years, objected Mrs. Gibson. Oh, it's so lovely today. It can't hurt you. I want you to see the crab tree in bloom. You can't see it unless you go out, and the wind is south today, so you'll get the clover scent from Norman Johnson's field. I'll bring you your tea, and we'll drink it together, and then I'll get my embroidery, and we'll sit, sit there and criticize everybody who passes. I don't hold with criticizing people, said Mrs. Gibson virtuously. It ain't Christian. Would you mind telling me if that is all your own hair? Every bit, laughed Anne. Pity it's red. Though red hair seems to be getting popular now. I sort of like your laugh. That nervous giggle of poor Pauline's always gets on my nerves. Well, if I've got to get out, I suppose I've got to. I'll likely catch my death of cold, but the responsibility is yours, Miss Shirley. Remember, I'm 80. Every day of it, though I hear old Davy Ackham has been telling all around Summerside I'm only 79. His mother was a Watt. The Watts were always jealous. and moved the, wheel the wheelchair deftly out and proved that she had a knack of arranging pillows. Soon after, she brought out the tea and Mrs. Gibson deigned approval. Yes, this is drinkable, Miss Shirley. Ah, me. For one year, I had to live entirely on liquids. They never thought I'd pull through. I often think it might have been better if I hadn't. Isn't that the crab tree you were raving about? Yes, isn't it lovely, so white against the deep blue sky? It ain't poetical, said Mrs. Gibson's sole comment, but she became rather mellow after two cups of tea in the forenoon wore away until it was time to think of dinner. I'll go and get it ready, then I'll bring it out here on a little table. No, you won't, miss. No crazy monkey shines like that for me. People would think it awful queer us eating out here in public. I ain't denying it's kind of nice out here, though. The smell of clover always makes me kind of squamish. And the forenoon's passed awful quick to what it mostly does, but I ain't eating my dinner out of doors for anyone. I ain't a gypsy. Mind you, wash your hands clean before you cook the dinner. My Mrs. Story must be expecting some company. She's got all the spare room bedclothes airing on the line. It ain't real hospitality, just a desire for sensation. Her mother was a Carrie. She's all about whose mother's who. The dinner Anne produced pleased even Mrs. Gibson. I didn't think anyone who wrote for the papers could cook, but of course Marilla Cuthbert brought you up. Her mother was a Johnson. 
I suppose Pauline will eat herself sick at that wedding. She don't know when she's had enough, just like her father. I've seen him gorge on strawberries when he knew he'd be doubled over in pain an hour afterwards. Did I ever show you his picture, Miss Shirley? Well, go to the spare room and bring it down. You'll find it under the bed. Mind you don't go prying into the drawers while you're up there. But take a peep and see if there's any dust curls under the bureau. I don't trust Pauline. I guess that's him. His mother was a walker. There's no men like that nowadays. This is a degenerate age, Miss Shirley. Homer said the same thing 800 years B.C., smiled Anne. Some of them Old Testament writers was always croaking, said Mrs. Gibson. I dare say you're shocked to hear me say so, Miss Shirley, but my husband was very proud in his views. I hear you're engaged to a medical student. Medical students mostly drink, I believe, have to to stand the dissecting room. Never marry a man who drinks, Miss Shirley, nor one who ain't a good provider. Thistle down in moonshine ain't much to live on, I can tell you. Mind you clean the sink and rinse the dish towels. I can't abide greasy dish towels. I suppose you'll have to feed the dog. He's too fat now, but Pauline just stuffs him. Sometimes I'll, sometimes I think I'll have to get rid of him. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Mrs. Gibson. There are always burglaries, you know, and your home is lonely off here by itself. You really do need protection. Oh, well, have it your own way. I'd rather do anything than argue with people, especially when I've such a queer throbbing in the back of my neck. I suppose it means I'm going to have a stroke. You need your nap. When you've had it, you'll feel better. I'll, t I'll tuck you up and lower your chair. Would you like to go out on the porch for your nap? Sleeping in public? That'd be worse than eating. You do have the queerest ideas. You just fix me up right here in the sitting room and draw the blinds down and shut the door to keep the flies out. I dare say you'd You'd like a quiet spell yourself. Your tongue's been going pretty steady. Sounds to me like Miss Gibson's has. Mrs. Gibson had a good long nap, but woke up in a bad humor. She would not let Ann wheel her out on the porch again. Want me to catch my death in the night air, I suppose, she grumbled, although it was only five o'clock. Nothing suited her. The drink Ann brought her was too cold. The next one wasn't cold enough. Of course, anything would do for her. Where was the dog? Misbehaving, no doubt. Her back arched. Her knees ached. Her head ached. Her breastbone ached. Nobody sympathized with her. Nobody knew what she went through. Her chair was too high. Her chair was too low. She wanted a shawl for her shoulders and an afghan for her knees and a cushion for her feet. And would Miss Shirley see what that awful draft was coming from? Where that awful draft was coming from? She could do with a cup of tea, but she didn't want to trouble, be a trouble to anyone. And she would soon be at rest in her grave. Maybe they might appreciate her when she was gone. Oh my gosh. It's a long chapter, but it's good. Be the day short or be the day long. At last it weareth to evening song. There were moments when Anne thought it never would. But it did. Sunset came and Mrs. Gibson began to wonder why Pauline wasn't coming. Twilight came, still no Pauline. Night and moonshine and no Pauline. I knew it, said Miss Gibson cryptically. You know she can't come home till Mr. McGregor comes and he's generally the last dog hung, soothed Anne. Won't you let me put you to bed, Mrs. Gibson? You're tired. I know it's a bit of a strain having a stranger around instead of someone 
you're accustomed to. The little puckery lines about Miss Gibson's mouth deepened obstinately. I'm not going to bed till that girl comes home, but if you're so anxious to be gone, go. I can stay alone or die alone. At half past nine, Mrs. Gibson decided that Jim Gregor was not coming home till Monday. Nobody could ever depend on Jim Gregor to stay in the same mind 24 hours, and he thinks it's wrong to travel on Sunday even to come home. He's on your school board, ain't he? What do you really think of him and his, and his opinions on education? Anne went wicked after all she had endured a good deal at Mrs. Gibson's hands that day. I think he's a psychological anachronism, she answered gravely. Mrs. Gibson did not bat an eyelash. I agree with you, she said, but she pretended to go to sleep after that. Phew! That's all of chapter 13. I can't wait to hear how Pauline's time was. What a day Shirley had with that Miss Gibson. Oh, my gracious. Okay, well, that was all of 13, and we'll be on chapter 14 tomorrow. Good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. And I hope to see all of you today live at 5. Tea with Granny D. Be sweet, don't be ugly, and I'll see you then. Love you. Bye-bye.